Hey there, everyone, and welcome back to The Dark Parade. I, of course, am your host, Bo. Uh, I am here to guide you through these proceedings and welcome you uh, to an episode that I had uh, an absolute ball recording. Mostly because sometimes when I'm doing the show, uh, you know, I end up talking more than even I want to hear myself talk. Uh, just because it's a podcast, right? Somebody's got to be talking, and uh, and and sometimes uh, the guest that I'm with is a little more uh, reserved, and so I end up doing a, a bunch of the the jibber jawing. Uh, this is a case where my guest tonight, Duncan McLeish and uh, Doug Tilly, we have recorded a number of times in the past, uh, both for summer series stuff and just various. Uh, uh, looks at directors like we do the the like the Friedkin episode uh, for podcast under the stairs we did not long ago and uh, Coen Brothers episodes and you basically pick a director and then we watch a bunch of movies and come together and kind of roundtable a discussion about that so we have a long and storied history chit chatting about movies and when I opened it up for listener requests for the month of February. Uh, which I, you know, fingers crossed will be a tradition. Uh, Lord willing and the creek don't rise as the saying goes. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, to get some interesting selections, stuff that I normally would not watch. And Doug Tilly was quick to chime in with science crazed, a movie that he has championed, uh, both, uh, here on the dark parade and also on a podcast under the stairs under that group trying to get Duncan to take a look at that movie. And so we did it. We talked about the movie Science Craze, which is a really, really low budget, you know, DIY kind of movie from Canada that Doug <laughs> has a a blurb on the DVD for. Uh, and we talk about that. We talk about the movie. It, it was a really great time. I had so much fun uh, recording this conversation about Science Craze, a movie that uh, I'm not going to say I never would have gotten around to it, but certainly not anytime soon. And, uh, and it was sort of worth the time. Um, but you be the judge. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. It was really a, a tremendous amount of fun to record. It was very funny. And, uh, and I think you're going to like it. So without further ado, here is my discussion with Doug Tilly and Duncan McLeish on the film Science Craze. And thank you, folks, as always for joining the dark parade. All right, folks, as promised, here is the, the first time that on this podcast, we have had two hosts at the same time. I think that there was uh, a, a, a period where we were going to have a, a threesome, but then, you know, one person felt awkward and backed out. Uh, <laughs> so this is the first true menage a trois. Uh, here on the Dark Parade, and I could not uh, imagine two kinder, more loving, more giving partners <laughs> than uh, Duncan McLeish from the podcast on the stairs, and uh, Doug Tilly from No Budget Nightmares and Cinema Smorgasbord. We'll get into all that here in a minute. But uh, first of all, welcome, gentlemen, for what promises to be uh, a genre defying effort. But was it okay if I just watch for a while and then I'll join in if I feel comfortable? Yeah, you don't have to jump right in. See, you like, pick your moment. Um. This, is, this is how selfish I am. Doug Tilly's been, um, I think, for, for, it must be about six years, every time I've ever opened the gates to, like, any listeners got a suggestion of a movie to pick, the movie that we're going to be discussing tonight is almost inevitably in one of the top three posts straight away by Doug Tilly, and I've avoided it for the longest time. And when I realized, Bo, that you had done the same thing, and then Doug had done the same thing, but you were actually entertaining this suggestion, mm -hmm. um, I selfishly said, if I jump on that, Doug will never suggest it again. Uh -huh. um, well. And he has since made a comment in our group chat saying that he made no no commitment to that, which is true. Actually, I should have I should have taken a second to get it in writing first before D agreeing. Duncan, it's so. important to note that this treatment that I give you regarding the film we're going to be talking about today is a treatment I give many people. <laughs> if anyone's like on a Friday night, night saying, you know what, does anyone have a movie to recommend for me to watch tonight? I'm always the first one in there. 
uh, and we'll find out why. We'll we'll, we'll explain well, it to we'll, the audience. Like yeah, me and Bo have been uh, speculating on our uh, our recordings that we've been <laughs> having together for the last couple of weeks that maybe this is a Ponzi scheme or a pyramid scheme, or maybe you were the director. Just like, or, or, is this for? tax purposes and funneling money for the mob it's like we're still trying to quite work out out with the fact that your name is actually physically on the copy of the movie that Bo bought uh, I yeah, can't imagine it's yes. that it is important to point out that Doug Tilly's name appears on the DVD that I, I purchased yeah well I mean I, I want to make it very clear I get very little money from each <laughs> sale <laughs> very little is not zero though so this is suspect to say the least <laughs> no, my connection with Science Crazy. Can we talk about that actually just a little bit up front? Please, uh, please, please, because I want to know why you're, you, you, you've been so gung-ho on this for so long. I was introduced to Science Crazed by the director, Josh Johnson, uh, the director of the documentary Rewind This. He does a commentary on that DVD that you have. I've listened, um, yes. He, he was fascinated by this movie that he was introduced to by Paul Krupp, who is the uh, owner of Conexploitation, the Conexploitation website. So, mm. they, uh, and, and, and they talk about this a little bit on that commentary. So they c had connected together because Paul was being uh, interviewed for that documentary and he told them about this movie. Josh hunted it down and he became, I think it would be safe to say, semi-obsessed with it. And Josh is a friend of mine. Actually, his life has intertwined with mine in all sorts of different ways. And this must have been a decade ago at this point, certainly around that time. And he was talking this movie up. And of course, at that time, No Budget Nightmares, which is a podcast that I have devoted to micro-budget cinema, it seemed like it would fit perfectly into it. So I'm like, oh, I got to check this movie out. And I watched it and... It was like hearing music for the first time, right? <laughs> <laughs> like colors changed, my perspective on the universe changed. It was like, <laughs> and I want this to be very clear for anyone who hasn't listened to No Budget Nightmares, which I imagine is most, if not all of the listeners right now. The movies that we cover on that show can only very loosely be described as movies most of the time, mm. right? We're talking about filmed in your backyard with a video camera in the 90s, I mean, with no money, no professional actors. So we were very used to the idea of kind of non-standard filmmaking and amateurish filmmaking. I like to call it DIY filmmaking because I think it has more of a cooler edge to it. But frankly, <laughs> a lot of people who don't know what they're doing trying to do something. And I think that that's really fascinating. And I think the peak of that form came in Canada in the late 80s when Ron Switzer decided to make Science Craze <laughs> Obviously, with some people who were like, I am committed to this idea. And when I sat down to watch it and tried to puzzle it out, it was like, I mean, it really was like the Hellraiser puzzle box. It was like, I got to fit the pieces <laughs> together. And once it all clicked for me, I was like, well, now I'm going to be torn to shreds. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, the, there's a kind of hurting in the, um, in the process of watching Science Crazed that I don't think has been matched in any other film ever. And it's unique. <laughs> it's, it's, and, and we're going to, we're going to dance around this word bad. I'm sure in this conversation today, the badness that exists in science crazed is the most unique kind of badness that you will ever see in a movie because the movie that this is most commonly compared to is another Canadian horror movie things. Now, if you know the movie things and I think a lot of people do, cause it played on the Joe Bob Briggs thing and stuff. If you know things, that's still a movie. Right? There's still stuff that happens in that movie. It's not a really even a fair comparison because in Science Crazed, nothing fucking happens. Yeah. Nothing. And sometimes <laughs> it feels like those jokes, which is like the joke, the punchline of the joke. And the reason that it's funny is that it just goes on and on and on. And it starts becoming funny and then it becomes not funny and then it becomes funny again. It's <laughs> like that in a movie form, except instead of trying to be funny, who knows what it's trying to be. <laughs> it's the most incredible experience of movie watching I can ever uh, I can ever relate to somebody. And that's why there is a quote from me on it that says that you've never, ever seen a movie like Science Craze, I promise you. And I stand by that. There's no movie like this, which is why it's important that every podcast talk about it. <laughs> All right, as full-throated a defense as the movie shall ever receive. Um, I have not yet begun to fight. <laughs> so... I, and I look. Let me let me say now. I am really on the fence with where I, I sit with this movie, and throughout this conversation, I can be swayed. Like I am, I am truly that rarest of of creatures, which is the swing voter. 
um, <laughs> where I don't like. There's part of me that <laughs> believes purple state bull. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I am. <laughs> that's what they call me, purple state bull. <laughs> it part of me after watching this twice, once just to experience it uh, initially, and then again to get the commentary in and just to hear somebody else talk about this movie that was living in my head and I was like why why is everything happening in one building what is going mm. on here you know mm. all of that stuff like why does it take so long to get to the aerobics room um <laughs> and then after listening to the commentary and watching it a second time there really is something about the movie that I find, I mean, for lack of a better term, charming or, or at least compelling that they're like, and, and Doug had said this in, in our, our kind of group chat that there is a distinct artistic vision. And I kind of buy that. I think that this is made by somebody who definitely had an idea of the movie he wanted to make. And I don't know if he fumbled into some sort of Lynchian weirdness <laughs> or it, like if it was incompetence or intention, that is the thing that like every moment in this movie that I'm constantly asking that question of like, did he mean for this to be this like off putting and, and every frame of, of this movie daring you to continue watching it in a way that makes you not able to stop watching it. I remember the first time I watched Science Crazed, and during that aerobic scene, which I'm sure we're going to talk about in some more detail, and I want to get yeah. Duncan's take on this as well. <laughs> when we were five minutes into that nine-minute scene, mm -hmm. I audibly said, "Are you fucking with me right now, yeah. movie?" Like yeah. it seems like the movie isn't is intentionally fucking with the audience, but it's not. I don't think there is a incompetent sincerity to Science Crazed that is is one of the most unique things about it. The people here are putting on a show. They want to mm. make something that's good, which, by the way, is one of the things reflected on the fact that you see those movie posters in the movie, right? They mm -hmm. know what a good movie looks like, and that is what they're <laughs> trying to do. And then this is what they came up with. <laughs> yeah. So in addition to uh, the, the commentary, the other thing that is all up uh, on the, uh, the DVD is there are some interviews with the one of the actors who seem to have come away from this with like uh, appreciates at least the the <laughs> fact that the the film has found kind of a, a cult following mm. and um uh, when he talks about Ron Switzer the the guy who wrote produced directed uh the the creative force Behind singular science vision, both. The, singular, the vision. singular vision, <laughs> and um, uh, the guy's name Cameron Scholes is, is is the guy's name. And uh, when he talks about the movie, he's like, again, this is all through the prism of him describing this. Is mm -hmm. about mm, a day into this, he was like, I knew what this movie was, right, mm. and. But Ron Switzer either did not, or, like, it seems like, and I, I think this is, uh, when, whenever I hear someone describe a fiasco, it's always people uh, <laughs> reaching beyond their grasp. Yeah. And so I think that's where science craze falls, is that it's somebody who had this idea of, like, I'm going to do this modern retelling of Frankenstein. <laughs> But I have, and, and I have an idea of what this should look like, but I have no skill whatsoever to carry it off. And we have, or we have one spotlight. We have one spotlight in, in my apartment building. We have three hallways, a one yeah. spotlight and a 30 page script. And we are going to put on a show and this is going to be the one people remember me for, for sure. Yeah. yeah. All, right, all right. So let, all right, let's get into this story. And by all means, interrupt at any time to interject here with, with uh, detail. But so it starts. <laughs> okay, at, I'm going to interrupt you just there at the beginning. Yes, please. Which yeah. is that one of the other special features on that DVD includes another uh, fan 
of the movie, which is the writer of Pontypool, Tony Burgess. That's right. Um, mm-hmm. A big science crazed uh, uh, aficionado. Uh, and I mean, I know both of you. I think both of you like Pontypool. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I love Pontypool. And yeah. I mean, so re- at this point, you have the word of me, your beloved friend Doug Tilly, and the writer of Pontypool <laughs> that science crazed is something worth appreciating so i hope that that is something that you were taking with you as you were sitting down watching it yeah originally his book was called uh science craze changes everything (laughs) but it was just for legal reasons that had to be changed um but all right so so it starts off at the, the shelley institute and i don't know if you guys noticed this but uh, that is a reference to Mary Shelley. What? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Also, so, his name is Doctor Frank, which yes. again you may not have noticed this. <laughs> I, I, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm going to say there was there was no more kind of tear in the eye moment than the moment they they killed off Doctor Frank so early because that is one cool motherfucker. You know that because of the sunglasses. Oh, he's cool. <laughs> All right. He's like, did you did you see him wear those sunglasses, and speak delayed and overdubbed? That was, I mean, <laughs> right, did you I'll... see? Did you did you drink it in? Did, all I'm asking is, did you? Uh, no better overdubbing, which didn't match how a character looked, has been seen on screen since the aforementioned Uncle Frank from Hell Razor. Um, you know, you hear him for the first time, you're like that. American that, that, that that voice does not match that body. <laughs> he, he's clearly British. It's what the fuck are we here? It's the voice when they ADR Pee Wee Herman in Pee Wee Herman's Big Adventure. It's paging Mr. Herman. Mr. Herman, you have a telephone call. I'm that- sensing a level of disrespect for this movie very early on. <laughs> what? what? No. Uh, you know what? My response is that I'm going to I'm going to talk like Dr. Frank for the rest of this movie. I can't wait for that. No, no, yes. this is nothing but this is nothing but love. I mean, it references Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. That's right. Yeah. Well, well it's great. straight away. <laughs> And so one of the producers of the movie playing a scientist or, or the head of the Institute or whatever is, and who all of this, filmed, who was maybe filmed four months before the actual scenes of Dr. Frank before, after <laughs> it could have been anything. Potato, potato. Um, yeah. And, and as, as we've kind of discussed already, or at least hinted at, um, all of the audio in this movie is ADR. Like there is no and it's horrible. It's yeah. ho- sorry, I, I, I love you, Doug. It's, hor- it's horrible because he didn't use the same microphone, right? And my ears. Are you can hear the tune. microphones uh, kick in yeah. where there's a suddenly <laughs> that squealing sound. And did you notice? I mean, I'm jumping way ahead, but when they dub all the audio for the pool party later on, some of the women are dubbed by men. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what is he doing here? Yeah, it's quality, quality. <laughs> <laughs> it, all right so the the head of the institute is like hey dr frank you cannot continue uh with your experiments because they're an affront to god and man uh-huh. and he, he's like well i <laughs> he talks like christian uh bale's batman um <laughs> swear to me um i'll yeah. get some more funding <laughs> this is like hockey pads <laughs> This is extremely important to biological science. And uh, so, but it, uh, his money is pulled. And so he decides he's going to conduct his experiments on the down low. Yeah. Uh, by which I mean, he goes to another room where a woman is tied to a chair. Goes to a factory. <laughs> it's the fucking, this is a room where people get tortured, Bo. Come on. <laughs> well, I mean, I this think this actually insult. brings up, a, this brings up a very important point, which is, where does this movie take place? Is it a apartment building? Is it storage? Is it is it multiple locations? I'm looking for I'm looking forward to the documentary done by the guys that did Room Two Three Seven, where they explain <laughs> the geography of this building, because um, it, it's weirdly Kubrickian. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it's actually all about the indigenous genocide, and I think that you should probably uh, tune into that, Duncan. Yeah, well, well I mean, yeah, <laughs> between that and the Holocaust Bowl, obviously, play it backwards. Um, so, uh, back, we should have played Science Craze backwards. Miss an opportunity to play them, like, forward and backward at the same time, superimposing, to see if we could see Hitler's face. Um, yeah. I'm sure it's in there, uh, but, like... It's not Ron like, Switzer does the moon landing, and it's just someone walking for <laughs> 90 minutes. <laughs> Just through a dusty hallway. 
dragging his foot behind him. Um, that's, it. that's how they did it. Uh, like, yeah, it's not even like we, we jump to the next scene, and there's not, like we we don't know. Like you, like you get you get so scant information in this, which is so weird because generally, when your movie doesn't have <laughs> effects, um, are you know like like a, a huge amount of uh, what, what we can say. Um, like action to propel the story, you fill it with needless dialogue. This movie is surprisingly not a lot of dialogue, so we don't even get as kind of, you know, I'll show them or anything like that. The next scene is like him using Duncan's like infamous chat up line, "You will be pregnant in three hours," <laughs> um, which is what every single time for me, obviously. Yeah, um, at least twice. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you will be pregnant in three hours, and then. 21 hours, uh, you, you'll, you'll give birth to a healthy baby boy. None of, like, she is pregnant, the healthy baby boy thing isn't true. Um, but uh, th this woman, this woman here is fucking amazing, right? Like, <laughs> like this woman in the chair um, is absolutely amazing. I, I played out the whole movie It Follows, mm -hmm. but instead of the main character in that chair, it's this woman, and that movie just got <laughs> infinitely better. Um, she is... Absolutely, like to the point where, and the scene goes on for everything goes on long, but like she is essentially injected with. We couldn't afford uh, a kind of reanimator fluorescent <laughs> green, so it's kind of like a really dingy pond water green <laughs> color. <laughs> uh, she's injected with that boat, and guess what? She gets pregnant. Yeah, yeah, okay. and and has uh, you know said baby just is it a baby or is it a leg of lamb um, I mean <laughs> I, kind of what it looks like it, it, there's a hint of that the fly maggot baby kind of yes, thing yes yes and just in, in all deference to the movie there is uh, a lot of kind of body horror stuff happening oh 100% in, yeah. in this scene um, it's, an, it's in our DNA up here <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, apparently <laughs> it so it must be it must be <laughs> And we, we look at ourselves in the mirror and just are horrified by what we see. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like all, everybody up there grew up Catholic. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they wrap up this baby in quotes in uh, some gauze. Gauze, yeah. And then there's an extended sequence of heavy breathing. Yeah. As for the next 80 minutes. It, yeah. <laughs> That <laughs> is indicative of like the baby growing quickly into a man sized thing. Yes. Yeah. I mean that and that, ladies and jelly spoons, is more than the movie is telling you. <laughs> but I I feel like it is uh it is accurate. Yeah, it lingers, guess, over, it lingers over a man's nipples for yes. an extended period of time. We see him breathing in and out for minutes on end, mm -hmm. just a body breathing. And that, because they don't have the special effects to show a baby growing into a full-grown man, just seeing a man breathe is our, as the audience, we have to work it out in our mind. That is what is happening here. Though I have to be honest, probably took multiple views for me to connect those things together. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, uh, and, and to the movie's credit, See, Doug Tilly, to the movie's credit. Thank you. Like, we go from, like, scientists being fired to experimental injection to we now have a killer in 10 minutes. This movie, this movie, this movie rocket, within 10 minutes, we have a fully grown man elf thing. Yeah. No one would ever accuse science craze of taking its time. <laughs> well, that, I was about to say, for, for, uh, the, the problem is, from that point onwards, it kind of feels like we rushed to begin him because from that point onwards, everything is labored. Like, yeah, well, but, you, I mean, once you just want to get through that so you can get to the good stuff. Certainly. You want to get to the good stuff, which is a lot lumping. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> we see our creature for the first time, which is a dude with a kind of a bloody white t shirt. Yeah. Yes. Some gauze wrapped around his face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Spock ears. Yeah, Spock the ears. picture. Yeah, th think think Hannibal Lecter, Silence of the Lambs, in the 
actually Pembry, as <laughs> Pembry, um, in the ambulance, taking the mask off, but with pointy ears, and it's not as good as that. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, but but as I was thinking to, it, it's such a weird this because they never, they never. They don't give you anything. <laughs> I, I will say that the first time I watched this movie, it was before the DVD version came out. And let's make this clear as well. You can buy the DVD version through Video Namicon, uh online, but it is just a a rip of the VHS. There's no better version of this available. I did not know that those were Spock ears for multiple viewings of this. I thought he had some <laughs> sort of weird banana sticking out of his fucking head. <laughs> or it could be, I, initially I thought, well, it could be antennae. Mm. As if he is receiving uh, messages from Q. Uh, <laughs> I, I love this idea that of the banana, as if he's like that character in Naked Gun that keeps eating the banana and there's a bit stuck to the side of his face. You've got a bit of banana on the side of your face and half a banana <laughs> drops off. <laughs> he's wearing the bananas to ripen them up faster because he's got some banana bread to make. And um, Yeah, it, it, so it's... It's very silly, this look. Uh, but the monster then uh, goes after... Also, Bo, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, but I think it's important that we accurately refer to the monster in this as the fiend. That's what he is. Yes. He He's is the, the fiend. fiend in science, Chris. Yes. Yeah. So the fiend then Thank you. goes after <laughs> Dr. Frank, uh, who says, I created you. You can't kill me. And and the monster ha or the fiend, apologies. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Credit where it's due. <laughs> um, the fiend has basically one move, which is to strangle people, a la the mummy. Yeah, he does the mummy, the the, the mummy, the mummy move. Um, so we're just hitting all the classics here. Yeah, <laughs> Frankenstein, the mummy. Yeah, absolutely. It's a learned movie. No yeah. one's going to argue that this isn't a classic horror film or classically inspired <laughs> at the very least. Um, but yeah, so his. Th then uh, the, the fiend takes off after killing Dr. Frank. Dr. Frank's body is discovered by two of our three main characters from this point on, mm -hmm. uh, which are uh, the guy played by Cameron Scholes who shows up all over that DVD to talk about, like, nobody was taking this very... Well, not nobody was taking this seriously. I wasn't taking this seriously. Um, and then his lady pal... Yeah, the blonde perm woman, and they have a suitably sarcastic comment about Dr. Frank's credentials and whether or not, because um, he's all in, he's like that, listen, you know, he's creating life from scratch, this is like something that doesn't happen, and I was like, well, it does, like, humans can create life from scratch, it's <laughs> biology, well, uh, but yeah. you know what I mean? Tell me <laughs> more, know? Duncan, I want to hear the details. <laughs> 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 but their their argument's so sarcastic, and I kind of love it because the end where like most married couples end up, which is like a well maybe I'll phone him. Oh well, maybe you should phone him then. <laughs> it's like a, I was like, yeah, I like this. This is amazing. But yeah, they they find the body um, and shock they, horror. Are, yeah. Who are they? Employees of Doctor Frank? I think they're assistants. Is it? Yes. Uh, yeah. They are listed as assistants. Assistant. Yeah. They yeah. they seem to have little respect for the work that Doctor Frank was doing. <laughs> <laughs> they're skeptical of their boss's <laughs> intentions at the very least. Oh man. And, and so they are like, well, we got to call the police, but the pol there's not a lot of police around because quote <laughs> it's a holiday. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they get Inspector McCoy on the right, case. Listen, you know, but I can hear the shade being thrown here already. Listen, Canada was, and I think maybe isn't anymore, although I might be wrong, part of the Commonwealth, right? We still are. That's good to know. And it's part of being in this Commonwealth is that you are afforded public holidays and lots of them, right? Absolutely. Well, 100%. I can't help it that you have to make them up for like three day and whatever else you have over in America. It's but called over Arbor here, Day, we just, you sarcastic yeah, we, son we, of a bitch. <laughs> we, we, we respect our workers and we give them holidays, adequate holidays, adequate time off, paid, paid adequate time off, unlike your backwards nation, right? So before you start hitting out with the police being on holiday, sometimes people work and get holidays, Bo. 
Yeah, and also we some for some reason the video stores have to be open during those holidays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a law here in Canada. Right. It's so that's another head scratcher <laughs> is that this one on duty cop is yeah. trying it really <laughs> getting handsy with a copy of Rambo that he is theoretically going to rent. <laughs> But he ends up uh, getting a phone call from the police at this video store because, of course, that's where he's going to be. That's where he spends his time, both. Yeah. Yes. And so they're like, hey, we've got a problem at the Institute or wherever. <laughs> and <laughs> anyway, and so um, he drops his copy of Rambo that, you know, it was like a real situation of like, He's in the adult bookstore and just thumbing through the magazine and somebody's got to be like, hey, are you going to buy that or what? Like, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> let's shit or get off the pot with Rambo. And <laughs> he takes off. Um, and then we come to, uh, I guess this is the, the aerobic scene that we come to Dead. like yeah like doug wanted that doug wanted a, a feedback from duncan here like i like and i have said it before i am not i i'd like well, i'm the first to put my hand up and say that there are certain movies that i like love that are bad they're bad cinema one one such movie is pieces which i talk about a lot and there's an aerobic scene in pieces that goes on what a lot of people would argue is far too long which now feels like it doesn't go on long <laughs> enough compared to science craze. Like, oh, like, you sweet like, summer child. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 like, the, 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 the PC's aerobic scene, I think, goes on for five minutes, and it's the killer walking round to essentially find the door to get in, which there is no payoff there. Um, but <laughs> in the case of this one, this scene goes on for like 15 minutes. 15 minutes! I couldn't believe... I could not believe... We went from... That right, they're dancing, uh, doing like some step aerobics, mm -hmm. and then we are we are hitting the weights for a long time, for a, a, a long time, and then we've got like the longest corridor in the history of the world that our killers walking up, um, or a series of them. There's no way to tell. Uh, there's no way to tell. But uh, all I know is the payoff. Like this is where I think, like maybe like you were saying, Doug, is this guy? Is this guy? fucking with me that was my that was my thought like because we're go i'm going that the payoff's going to be like something pretty gruesome obviously no nope. <laughs> like it's, it's like it's like someone doing that like norm mcdonald used to do that kind of really 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 long joke sure um which didn't have the, and that's what this is like it's like the you know it's this like huge huge setup to something that is wholly anticlimactic um and i kind of just sat going Wow. <laughs> like the, the, it's the fucking balls on this guy. <laughs> to describe it uh, perhaps a little more precisely, it's two women. <laughs> yeah, we need details here, Paul. Doing, <laughs> look, it, it's going to take less time than the actual scene, so don't even worry about it. <laughs> it's two women in, you know, 80s style aerobics outfits. Yeah. Doing half hearted aerobics, occasionally lifting weights. Yeah. Doing doing exercise stuff. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, there's some you know in quotes titillating shots of their asses as they're working out, and all of this is intercut with the fiend dragging his foot down the hallway as he approaches them in order to build suspense. Yes, and, and again, let, let us reiterate what Duncan just said. This is ten plus minutes yeah. of this, and in your mind, you're thinking, oh, 10 minutes. It's not that long of a time." When you're watching a movie <laughs> and it's just cutting back and forth between people exercising and then going back to this, uh, sometimes the same shot of the yeah. fiend dragging his leg, it's it doesn't. It feels shot. like literally hours of time. And I'm not like I'm not exaggerating here because remember, I'm the person actually trying to promote this film. Yeah, and if like, you look up. A... If you go on YouTube and look up exercise scene from Science Crazed, you will bring up a video uploaded by some guy named Doug Tilly. Uh, and you the can watch scene. it. Here. The, the, full, scene. the full scene is in there. Uh, it is the most incredible thing I think I've ever seen in a movie. It, it is it's... unbelievable. that that It's not even like, because the, the word that most people would be using right now is padding, right? Yeah. Because that's what you were talking about, Duncan. In a lot of these yeah. movies, padding is dialogue. 
in yes, this movie, that's what you do. <laughs> in you this have... movie, padding is just keep, just keeping the scene going for as long yeah. as you could possibly <laughs> fucking stand it. And that word that you used, by the way, Bo, titillating, that is something I don't disagree with it, but I don't understand it. Yeah. Like when you're watching this movie and you're watching these two women exercise, are we supposed to be titillated by it? There's a part where it zooms in on one of the woman's ass, right? Yeah. And it just fo- and it's like, oh, okay, we're supposed to think this is sexy. But then there's just there's endless scenes of them just like stretching and yeah. and and using exercise equipment in the least fucking titillating way possible. <laughs> yeah. And then you start to wonder, oh, is this supposed to be maybe funny? Are we? Are, is this? Did he just have access to some exercise video or something and decided to put <laughs> the footage in? And uh, and then you start. I mean, again, as it goes longer and longer, your brain is just searching for something to connect to, and it's just like, is this in the same building as the fucking experiment that happened? Is this a different building? Why? How did also, he get here? <laughs> isn't it supposed to be the middle of the night? What is going on? <laughs> it's uh, and so, yeah. It it, it transcends filmmaking and becomes uh, like a, a a test of patience that i yeah. i can't imagine everyone passing i think i think like tribes in the amazon like make like 14 year olds watch this scene as a as a feat of endurance for their transition into manhood um there's no longer you have to stand on top of like a <laughs> stand on top of a branch for two days without food or water i think it's just this 10 minute scene the amazing um, thing is, once the scene finishes, and, I'm, and I'm, I know we're not quite at that yet, but once the scene finishes, you, as the audience, are like, deep breath, sigh of relief. Yeah. Well, at least we're through that. And then the entire rest of the movie is just this again and again and again. Dude, it is more than 10% of the movie's runtime. <laughs> yes! Is this sequence. I mean, the, to say that the movie is about the fiend, it's it's like no, no, no. It is about the stalking of these yeah. women more than and and it happens it's, more it's, than it, once. But it's, it's a story about two friends going to an aerobics class set against the backdrop of a weird scientific experiment. <laughs> Yeah, and so after, <laughs> sorry, I just remember these women are more the main characters than any of the other characters. Yeah, right. <laughs> in terms of just sheer screen time, yes, these are the main They're characters. Totally they probably got at least five minutes more time than Doctor Frank gets. In oh, the- oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, oh, yes. absolutely, hundred percent, hundred percent, and maybe even the detective. Yeah, it's certainly on equal footing, but. Mm-hmm. All right, so after <laughs> it's like that that uh, holy grail bed where you see uh, the the knight like rushing across Absolutely. the uh, yeah. across the the field towards the castle. Yeah, and it just repeats the shot a couple of times where the guards mm-hmm. are like, "Is that dude running this way?" And then suddenly he's there. Yeah, it's that, and suddenly the fiend is there, and he again chokes <laughs> these two aerobics ladies to death. Well, I mean, yeah. it's important to note that before he chokes them, they just stare at him for almost a full minute. <laughs> there is yes. just st- not in fear, yes. just staring. It yeah, uh, it is idle curiosity more than fear for sure. I, I think huh. I want to think it's the director's interpretation of what the audience is doing at that point, <laughs> which is just kind of staring. <laughs> Silently, I, I actually had more of a horrified look on my face watching it. Than yeah, <laughs> the, the direction he gave the actors was look flummoxed. Yes, just yes, flummoxed. And, and it's also very important to note that we never see them get choked. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, like, after this like giant build up, that, it happens off camera. What you expect you expect like if you're gonna do that, the payoff is gonna be huge. And um, no, no. <laughs> subverts Uh, expectation in a very clever and artistic way but this is kind of the moment and and like i said purple state bow over here is where i look at this scene i'm like is (laughs) is this like accidental art yeah because i don't think i don't think (laughs) For a second, like, I don't think like Ron Switzer. Like all great art, Bo. Like like all great art, you get out of it what you bring. To that's it. 
it's... Let me make a comparison to Michael Haneke's funny games. <laughs> oh, <laughs> which is the look, idea somebody that had is, to do it. It was the obvious comparison. It is comparison. a film that shames you for what you expect <laughs> and what you desire yeah. out of a yes. movie like this. Yes. Right? It's like, I'm, we are going to hold you at this tension level for as mm-hmm. long as possible and then not give you the release that you expect from every other movie in the genre because that's why people watch the movies in this genre. Yeah. But, and instead of giving you it, they give you nothing and then they take it away again. <laughs> yeah. That explains so much why there's that point at the end where the detective is like, no, not like that. And then it rewinds. Yeah, rewinds. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're right. My, I, I, I hadn't really seen the Haneke esque uh, influence. Yeah, but you're Approach. right. All right. So then there's another. In my notes, it's described as a lab assistant, but really, you be the judge. Sure. Um, who is uh, runs afoul of the fiend, and she comes on to him question mark we've seen we've seen that being in shape and adrenaline packed will not do anything to stop the fiend so let's try love right open wounds on a person's body that seem to be continuously bleeding for hours on end (laughs) aside I mean, he seems to be a, a very in-shape gentleman uh, he in, does, yeah. say, 1988 Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Probably <laughs> not the most for prominent. A while. I mean, that's he, a lot of steps. If he did, had a Fitbit on him, Doug, that number would have been huge. The strong, silent type. And, I mean, you can ignore the ears, right? No problem yeah. there. So, yeah, she she starts rubbing her hands over his chest as if he's a hunk of meat. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and she... Uh, and really, that's what we're supposed to take away from this scene, is that if you are going to objectify the fiend, you have to expect consequences. Yeah. <laughs> I fucking love you right now. <laughs> it, it's kind of the equivalent of the scene in Young Frankenstein where Gene Wilder turns yep. on the monster and says, Hey, handsome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Also, let's, we have to be very clear. This scene is interminable. It just yes. keeps going and going. Yeah. Just she... staring. But the other thing, and this is very, very important for the style of the movie. Because again, this movie is strange in that no effort was put in certain areas. And then a strangely large amount of effort was put into others. There's lots of silhouettes. There's a lot mm-hmm. of shadow. There's a lot of faces that are just barely visible have we gotten to the scene yet where the woman is in the midst of the arcade and the, the camera's just circling around her <laughs> not yet not yet okay. we're it, it's coming but you're right it, like and, and in fact uh you know i think it's part of the commentary or maybe it's uh it was one of the interviews with cameron Scholl, who said you know when people would be like uh director ron switzer why are we doing this stupid shit again and he would he would invoke the names of like, you know, Hitchcock and Fritz Lang, and basically telling them well, that like spin, that spinning camera is you know, as a is a one of those tools like probably expertly utilized by Brian De Palma. Brian De Palma loves that shot of you have two cameras and that cam you have two characters together and that camera is going to spin and spin round and round and round and it's going to be huge and artistic and the music is going to be there and it's going to be cinematic perfection and they do it in this movie <laughs> um, i'm not going to say in the movie. even better <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> even better. it's the palma-esque hanukkah-esque you you know the the influences are numerous and uh, and and illustrious. On the sleeve, Bo. They're on the sleeve. And so, uh, ultimately, this woman fondling the fiend uh, gets murdered as well. And yeah. then we move on to the. This is the the scene that you were referencing, Doug. Where a, a, this woman. The, <sighs> It's five minutes. Tell me more. It is five <laughs> minutes of this woman standing in what seems to be a laundry room arcade with all the lights turned out. Yes. Yeah. As a spotlight is shown on her and the camera whips around her. And as is pointed out in the commentary of this, she's clearly saying something. Yes. She's yeah. talking nonstop. But yeah. none of that has been ADR'd. So it's we're just. Not, we're, we're not over. We're not recording audio for that, Bo. Right. <laughs> So the, other, looks... the other note from that commentary, by the way, is that it's 
this if this is supposed to be in the same building as everything else takes place, there seems to be a screen door. On the yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, most institutes have like a screen door for the staff. Um, and I don't understand. Yes. It's, well. it's, there is a level of art in terms of how this scene is shot, but the fact that it just keeps going on and on and on mm -hmm. and you're like i know where this is all headed like the feed's gonna show up and then murder her but and it doesn't in fairness doesn't go as on as long as say the aerobic scene but it goes on again for so long that you're like i don't understand what i'm <laughs> supposed to care about or what this means and i'm starting to question my own existence Mm -hmm. and and really reach some like a level of esoteric self-examination yeah you transcend this this is the sequence that will make you transcend as a viewer 100 yeah. percent. i mean it just leave you with some important questions which is who is this woman <laughs> yeah what is she doing yeah what is she saying yep. why should we care yep. what is the fiend doing there why yep. does it go on so long yeah i mean really all these questions questions and if you are expecting <laughs> answers my friend my friend no no answer ever <laughs> you will not get them and you could ask the people involved with the film for answers they will also not give them to you i yeah, mean this there director is, isn't, I'm, I'm glad we've already director, talked about david lynch this is a very lynchian scene yeah. in this movie. this director here isn't gonna like pull some sort of yeah the unicorn means he is a replicant shit like 20 years after the, you know the movie comes out he ain't gonna do that well, He's gonna lead these questions. You're telling me it's okay for David Lynch to show a guy just sweeping up the floor for five minutes, but it's not okay to have a De Palma esque spinning camera <laughs> Look, around a woman me in to answer that question, boy. <laughs> Ron, Ron, Ron Switzer, the one time yep. writer, director, producer, and editor of Science Crazed. Mm. And provides some of the dub voices as well. And yes, and voiceover <laughs> artists. Let's not take take away any of those. Is hyphens. he one of the women in this room? Yes. Yeah, a multi hyphenate. <laughs> like nobody, I I don't know if anyone knows where this guy is. It's like he just retreated to the wilds of Canada. Yeah, and. You this know, was a like, big sticking point about a decade ago. I mean, the whole, the, the big thing about Science Crazed was we need to find Ron Switzer. Does anyone know? And we found yeah. names that were close. And I mean, they talk about it in the commentary trying to track him down. They were able to find the actors. They were able to find the cinematographer. But he just, yeah, you're right. He seems to have vanished. As well as The Fiend, apparently, as Tony I, Della Ventura. <laughs> I, like, I, I like the fact that... Um, when they talk about in the, I don't remember if it's the commentary or if it was one of the Cameron Scholl interviews, but when he, they talk about Ron Switzer, he was like, you know, he was a shady dude. Let's all be clear about mm -hmm. this. Like somebody, uh, w like it was either an, one of the actors or a sound guy or something was like, Hey, do you, is there any money in the petty cash to pay for my cab home from the set? <laughs> and he was like, eh, what are you going to do? Low budget movie making. Am I right? <laughs> and he, like no money was spent on this up to and including all the performers so, it, it, it's laundered money uh, this is mob money right now i'm telling you right now this, <laughs> this reeks of rob uh, of mob money like I, I swear watching I, this movie i was just like this is how they do it but this Look, is the mob the mob made texas chainsaw massacre it doesn't have this to is be also science, true. this is also true this is also <laughs> true you know, i'll, I'll tell you true. if uh, what uh if there was a director <laughs> out there who decided instead of pulling an alan smithy <laughs> use the name ron switzer i would yeah. respect that move so much just to give this guy another credit I, I, it does it does kind of like there was that thing where like you do a bit of deep dive and like Doug was saying, trying to like the the mystery, trying to find this guy, and it's so like it's so bizarre. Um, and you think about other, the, you know, there are other directors that have that kind of mystique about them, and then it got me thinking about this is why, like, I think, I think at times, like as like to to him, this was like a Tuesday. He made this movie, right? You know what I mean? But the the kind of the mythology that stems out of it is that we all have questions that we think we're going to have these really interest, and I bet you if we ever do track him down, the answer will be well, it was Tuesday. I mean, the movie, like there is no like we're 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 looking too hard for complicated questions to or complicated answers 
to easy questions which might just have easy answers. So, there, there is something said that the original script in the special features, they say the original script was 30 pages without any, like, like, like it's just dialogue. It doesn't yeah. have anything in regards to how it was going to be, uh, how the scenes are going to play it out or stage direction or anything like that. And so you can imagine that you film it all in however many days and it's just like, well, we have 15 minutes of footage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And now, and this thing's got to be at least 83 minutes. So what are we yeah. going to do? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what we're going to do, Doug. We're going to go to the swimming pool. Yeah. Oh, God, this scene. So Once again, is it all on the same? Look, this is the, the, I genuinely started to, to perturb me if this was actually all. Because like, I, I was just trying to think of it. And it reminded me of um, <laughs> like that those horrible escape room movies. We were like, <laughs> is this all in one building? Like, you know, like, how can this all be in one factory? You know, like, so it's several floors, giant pits. Um, and I was like, may, maybe it's the same thing. Maybe they just build buildings different in Canada. Yeah, well, I mean, yes. Like, I mean, anyone who's watched uh, David Cronenberg's early films know that yes, there's, yes. there's a lot of stuff going on in these buildings because we have to stay <laughs> indoors more because of the weather. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is, I mean, I'm glad that we've reached this point in the movie because this is the most action-packed scene in the entire movie <laughs> by far. And it also has the biggest laugh in the movie where someone is looking at a magazine. You please, both tell us about it. <laughs> um, you'll have to remind me of the magazine bit because there's I'm, a woman by the pool and she has a copy, I can't remember, it's like a, a serious magazine of some sort, and then it cuts to her, 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 like her point of view, and inside of it is a centerfold, like a nudie picture, the only mm. nudie in the entire movie, or, or really anything of interest that would make this more than a G rating. <laughs> oh, right. and, and her eyes pop out, she's like, oh! <laughs> there's no explanation for why it's there, or why it took her so long to notice that that's what she was looking at, but that does happen in the movie. That's a, that, that feels like an onset prank. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like, like someone's like, hey, Ron, Ron you know what would be funny in yeah. this? <laughs> don't lay. <laughs> the, the thing that you know how Jane doesn't like full frontal nudity. Let's just slide the center fold in. <laughs> See a lot of takes and film her reaction. Like you know how she's a slow reader. That'll benefit us. Come on, let's do this. <laughs> I the thing that really stuck out for me in this scene is this. As far as the bad ADR goes, this oh, is the sound the, design is incredible. Yeah, the, I mean this is the high water mark of. So what? <laughs> what are they saying again? There's. In addition, as we pointed out earlier, that uh, there are obviously male voices, likely that of Ron Switzer himself, <laughs> saying things like, Oh my god, what is that? There's, <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> somebody yells out, Hey, why don't you get wet and wild? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty... And so it's, it's a, a, a swimming pool surrounded by lattice work. <laughs> And you we, know, actually, actually, going back to the sound during the aerobic scene, there's also like because there's no one talking. There's background there's, noise, yeah. There's, yeah. Back, there's background noise where that. people are saying things, but sometimes it feels like they're making fun of the women, yeah. or it's like you got to lose those pounds. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very odd and off-putting. Yes. Science crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the new tagline for the yes, back of the box. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. so <laughs> the the fiend shows up at the pool and <laughs> for the first time people seem upset by his presence yes yeah because he's not in a bathing suit yeah, that's right <laughs> that's that's the reason everybody's like, pervert. that's yeah. exactly what they're like um there's I mean, not, not upset in a way that they run like out of the room no no they just kind of they hover <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're like, what are you doing with those weird ears? And, uh, yeah. hey, get out of here, you. Yes. I mean, <laughs> not actually saying that, but we can imagine them saying something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, anyway, he, he drowns one lady in a pool. There's yep. uh, one dude uh, tries to throw some punches. and uh, That's not a bad move. Yeah. And he gets tossed back into the water or whatever and and if I, I remember correctly he gets thrown and then it cuts and he's being thrown on like the edge of the pool mm -hmm. and just rolls a little bit mm -hmm. he'll be fine he'll walk off <laughs> and 
The Fiend are, only kills women, by the way. I mean, that's kind of his deal. Yeah. I mean, he killed Dr. Frank, but, you know, that's that's his dad. About he's his creator, so yeah, that's yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, in traditional, like, in grand literary fashion, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yep. But, all right, so after this pool sequence, uh, there's some more wandering around in the hallways. We need to find where he's going next, Bob. <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> runs. A lot of rooms. A lot of rooms. <laughs> he runs into the lady assistant at one point but she actually gets away uh this, just this she just incredible. runs off this is yeah. an incredible moment is this the one they're looking for the fiend yes and so she's in the hallway and he's in the hallway and we don't know if he's looking for her or if uh or if she's looking for him because she is supposed to be searching for him but also we don't know if they're necessarily in the same hallway together because mm -hmm. the the sense of space and the sense of like the geometry of it makes no sense at all so yep. it's just it's the same sequence of her looking him dragging his foot her look and just back and forth and there's no tension and there's no anything and it just keeps you don't going need on tension but uh, uh, Doug asking oh, you don't need tension for this scene what this I mean I mean it's the it's it's uh, you know what Duncan, you you joke, sir, but it is pure cinema because you're bringing yourself to what mm -hmm. you're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's it's kind of like a Zen cinema. It's sort of like watching like uh, Baraka or something yeah, like yeah. that, yeah, where yeah. it's like you watch the images and you start to, it's like what is this character's motivation, and what is going to happen after I finish watching this movie and I have to reintegrate myself into the world? Yeah, I, I know. I now need to go upstairs and speak to my wife when this movie's finished. How can I even begin to form a conversation after what I've just seen? I know what you're saying. Right. I loved it, Doug. I yeah. loved it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I was it, there. It, it's like trying to meditate on ayahuasca. Yeah. yeah. The, the, only, the only thing more kind of, the only thing, I, 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 we're coming up to a scene soon, which I will not like even exaggerate even a little bit i i had tears rolling down my face it's Both the times greatest I watched this movie it's I my had... favorite scene in the movie it's one of the greatest things that i've ever seen in life like in, in yeah. the entirety of my entire life i had um, to hold my sides because i thought i was going to pee myself right if, if <laughs> anyone listening wants to check it out I, if i'm getting the scene correct uh look up yep. sweet sweet scene from science crazed on yeah. youtube and you could experience it as well but please bo i want to know what's yeah. happening in the plot all I right and, 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 the, and the corridors and the hallways of power <laughs> please let us know <laughs> so, so he ends uh, the fiend ends up finding a couple of goth girls oh mm -hmm. right and attacks them and then we get his his last volley of violence which is a woman who is sitting behind a desk <laughs> with voiceover yeah that says if if my notes are correct <clears throat> i suggest nerve gas tests to be done in the following countries mm -hmm. france <laughs> pause canada always a, pause. always a pause always a pause right there's so many pauses <laughs> united states italy <laughs> This goes on for Ooh. 15 countries. Yes, she, 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 I, listen, she can name 15 countries. Better than me, for, for <laughs> sure. But that, while she's doing that, we're also cutting back because it's required by Science Craze Law mm -hmm. that you're also seeing the fiend dragging his leg through the dragging hallway. <laughs> dragging that leg constantly <laughs> and th then he shows up in her room uh and you know chokes her out like you get her her dying there's a, a shot of her feet dangling to suggest that he has lifted her off the ground and choked her to death but i i submit to you gentlemen oh what the <laughs> <laughs> all right let me explain this scene to you please uh, i mean I, it's kind of important so she is suggesting that nerve gas tests be conducted in the following countries france <laughs> canada <laughs> united states uh-huh 
Italy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so on. So is she, again, is she in the same building as the uh, the experiments were going on at the beginning? Why is she just writing a list of this? Why is there suddenly an inner monologue? Why didn't the scene yeah. in the arcade have an inner monologue where a person was actually talking that we couldn't hear? <laughs> mm -hmm. This one has an inner monologue that connects it to some sort of, like, you know, obviously huge nerve gas test thing. Uh, and, and she must have some amazing power to be able to suggest that nerve gas tests. Either that or this is just all in her mind. Oh. And maybe it's all. Uh, Doug, Doug, and maybe this is, maybe this is, let me put it this way. Maybe this is just like I do this every now and again. I get really angry with something, and then I plot my revenge on the world internally in an inner monologue. Where I'm like, if I had some nerve gas, oh, those people over in Russia would be in trouble, and Finland, and oh, we were saying, sorry, Russia. Ixnay on the Usher Ray. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm in Scotland. Uh, <laughs> we're 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 fine here. No one's listening to this. Uh, we're we're fine. We're fine. Uh, but yeah, like like. like uh, like, cause I was watching it going, that, right? Cause we know it's a science institute. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> we know there was a science institute. We With know a one sweet pool. <laughs> we know there's, there's one room that's a science institute. And a, a pretty institute. decent arcade. Yeah. And a, a cool arcade and all the rest. So why, why would there be like, near, it's just so weird. I don't like, of all the scenes to put in this movie, like, why can't she just be like that? You, you know what? I'm just checking, like, on the phone to, like, I don't know, our broadband provider or our bank, <laughs> like, saying, <laughs> I'm looking at my checkbook just now, and it appears that I've wrote a check to Walmart, <laughs> Toys R Us. That pause wasn't long enough. But you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Why isn't it that? Why is it, like, nerve gas testing and the But, world? I mean, that is it. That's the question. Why? Yeah. Now, come up with an answer. I mean, well, well, we according, don't get according it, to David her. Lynch... We live inside a dream, inside a dream. We right? do. What, and, what year is it? <laughs> We're not going to talk about Judy. But yeah. in this movie, <laughs> yes. in this movie, we we don't know. We don't know the context. We don't know what's going on. Maybe yeah. it's good that the, the fiend killed. I'm on the fiend side in this one. I'm just, well, yeah, you like, know, I don't want to be controversial, but I'm anti-nerve yeah. gas tests in most oh, of this those is, this is the, this is the, this is the heel baby face turn to use exactly. wrestling par yeah. parlance here. 100%. This is when I was 100% behind the fiend. I was like, uh -huh. kill this woman before she nerves us all. Yes. Yeah. And, and honestly, and this is not something we've talked about for some reason. Bo has been avoiding the discussion of the actual <laughs> plot of this movie, which involves this, this police officer character helping yeah. these two employees hunt down the fiend and he i mean i'm just gonna say it seems like a bit of an asshole because yes. he does point his gun rather willy-nilly at oh, people dude, dude, <laughs> dude, the, the gun scene the gun scene which is like uh, like uh, clearly this is where the matrix stole um as as uh it's a uh, scene with the uh, what's his face um is the, is the agent? Agent <laughs> like Smith. The, Mr. The scene. Fiend. Yeah, 100% what happens coming up. When he shoots at the Fiend and the Fiend just like, the camera moves and he's like at the side. Like avoided that. This is where I yeah. was howling laughing. Yeah, by this the is way. bullet time except, except a decade earlier. Right? It's so much I mean, earlier than this. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. I, I mean, I was, I was, I was, I was floored by it. Literally had my hands on my head saying, While you were Please. floored, was there a, a foot slowly dragging across that floor? <laughs> <laughs> uh, interestingly, since I watched this, that's how I walk around the house now as well. <laughs> it's taking me longer to get places and people can hear me coming, but um, like the, the, the shots fired scene is just the, it's the greatest. That, and to me, it was my moment where I was like, there's no way someone makes this that doesn't have at least their tongue planted in their cheek. You know, like, even even yeah. if you were on the fence about any other scene about this where you're like, oh, it's kind of funny that it's played too long. Well, you know, maybe it is now. It's frustrating. Well, maybe it's funny again. Like, the um, scene of the cop shooting at the fiend and the camera just being like, yoink, move to the side. Yoink, imagine move to the imagine side. going to the cast screening for the premiere <laughs> of Science Crazy. I mean, this thing was shot on 16 millimeter, right? It's not, it's, a, it's yeah. on film. So you're yep. sitting there and just like, you know what, I, Ron, he was a little difficult to work with, but I really want to see his vision come to life on screen. <laughs> I've been in rooms, right? I mean, I saw, I went to a screening with Josh Johnson and Paul Group out in Toronto that was put on by P uh, Peter Kaplowski, where we also watched Things and the Frank D'Angelo movie No Deposit. And the oh, wow. crux of the day was that you had to pay to leave the screening. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, they ought to try that with that uh, Snyder cut as well. Um, yeah, so you're right. We, we have avoided talking about the the thrust of the plot, which is this Detective McCoy uh, on the hunt for the fiend. You you described the shooting sequence. And he misses, and then they uh, are oh, are dude. two. He doesn't just miss. Like, what you're right. The selling this scene wonderfully. Like I, we don't even see him duck. The camera pat, like the camera switches to the cop who's taken yeah. a long time setting up that shot, and then he fires the shot, and then the camera like then is on the fiend who's just leaning to the side. We don't actually physically get to see him dodge the bullet. He's already at the side. And then well, back the fiend the moves guy. so quickly it can't really be yeah. picked up. On, it's, it's on so, like, I've seen yeah. him walk through a car. I know how fast he walks. Uh, so <laughs> it's like a hummingbird. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it was it was the bit where like I just couldn't. I honestly felt like I was going to pass out laughing. Um, I thought it was like one of the funniest things I've ever seen recorded in cinema. So um, yeah, Bo, sorry. Anyway, he's uh, he's a bit gunsy and uh, he tried to shoot the fiend, and that's not working well for him. Right. So the fiend uh, stalks off, and we have our big climax of the film. <laughs> sorry, you're right. He stalks off. He doesn't run away because yeah, he's no. incapable of running. <laughs> right. He just walks away, and they're like, "Damn you, the fiend." <laughs> you and your <laughs> you and your leisurely pace <laughs> and so the finale of this movie takes place in the parking garage of the building or buildings yeah. or wherever yeah where the fiend is now stalking our two lab assistants who aside from the fact that they one time sit in front of an evil dead poster <laughs> do not matter to this movie at all <laughs> but then again, you can kind of say that of any character, I suppose. But <sighs> um, the fiend is stalking them, and then uh, the cop shows up. It, the fiend's finally unmasked, and we get to see what how science has progressed. <laughs> yeah, and I'll I'll admit his big lumpy goo face is not terrible. I mean, it's not it's great, not, but it's, it's not that bad compared yeah. to some of the things we've watched, Bo, so... Considering um, that th this guy's been wandering around in bandages and Spock years, my my <laughs> expectations for what this effect was going to be were suitably low, so that when it appeared, it's like, bandages oh! In, uh, bandages and Spock years is the name of my new whimsical indie music project <laughs> coming next year. <laughs> I, I would like to be part of that. I would, uh, like in... <laughs> A polyphonic spree esque way. I want to be in like a robe. Um, there should be there should be thirty people in the band. They're all wrapped in bandages uh -huh. at all times. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and and so the feed has has and the music should be dubbed over. Like you don't actually. See oh it. my god! Yes, <laughs> yes. Coming soon yeah. to the Patreon. <laughs> Yeah, you definitely put that behind the paywall. Oh, for sure. <laughs> like, yeah, you don't give that away for free. You charge people to leave. Oh, man, it's not on band camp. It's on band-aid camp. <laughs> oh. You're welcome. You can keep that. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, after he's unmasked, he's coming for our lab assistants. Uh, and the the detective shows up to shoot the fiend who yep. isn't killed by this and instead goes and bear hugs our detective until he dies. Yep. And then the, uh, Cameron Scholl, as, as it turns out, the, the real hero of the movie, uh, always going to be the hero. Always going to be the hero. Uh, pulls out a machete from uh -huh. somewhere just been, just been carrying with him all the way through this movie and uh brings it down into the shoulder of the fiend and the fiend falls down uh dead well, bullets don't do anything bo like you can only be killed by machete it's in the lore it's <laughs> yeah well you know uh as, as a wise point uh wise man pointed out uh the fiend don't text um, which gives him a commonality with machete. Uh, yeah, but so that's kind of... I didn't know that I wanted that I now so desperately want. 
<laughs> Machete be the th- the fiend. A hundred percent, yeah. And uh, but <laughs> the the what final Machete film? Well, simply it's entitled to be Machete, machete in Walk. Space, so can I like Machete in Space could be Machete versus Science Christ. I want that now. Oh, Make man. it happen. So yeah, so they they. they uh, Sorry, though, are the we guy. still on segment one of your podcast? <laughs> yeah, we are. The, 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 the rest of it ain't going to take that long. Um, so the, they kill the fiend. The fiend, uh, they, they take off. They're like, oh, what a horrible day. And <laughs> I mean, it felt like a day, right? When you watched it, it felt 100%. like. <laughs> 100%. Oh, yeah. 100%. It's a, like, I'll tell you, if I ever have a terminal illness. <laughs> I just want someone to put this movie on a loop because the rest of my life will feel like a fucking eternity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've heard of slow cinema before, right? Yes, yeah. this is it. This oh, is yeah. the originator of slow cinema. Um, and so as the credits roll, we get a, you know, the fiend will return in Revenge of the Fiend like he's James <laughs> yes. Bond or something. Exactly. That The fiend is not dead. And that's something I wanted no. you to make very clear. He may have been macheted. And injured, but we don't know how his physiology works. Well, he's got he opens his eye. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he yeah. opens his eye at the end, which means he's still alive. I've seen enough slashers to know that. Yep. Listener, listeners to this podcast, I'm speaking directly to you. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> there's been, there's been this thing over the past like 15 years or so where irony has infected uh, cinema. Mm. So people will find something like a samurai cop or uh yes yeah right or, or, or and other movies like that and oh, then me they'll mean bo are really guilty for this because we did what do you call it uh Winter blood... Beast. but what was the blood thing though <laughs> blood shack oh sure yeah yeah blood shack blood which is shack, like uh, uh, baby, blood shack. <laughs> and i would argue that blood shack is not as well made as this movie so uh, <laughs> i mean Dude, it's got on, le- it's got more rodeo it. stock footage yeah, oh, is that the a... is that the chooper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, the chooper. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where we couldn't be bothered filming a shot, we'll get like the guy's hat. Yeah, but that's off, a, that's just a la- that's a lazy that. movie. That's yeah. not science. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, but irony has infected movies like Deadly Prey and Samurai Cop, yeah. and people have made these these sequels that are just all winky. They're just winking at the camera the entire time. I am telling you, young filmmakers. There's an opportunity here for a follow-up to Science Craze. You, you don't have any actors you have to worry about. You just need a person in gauze. But I want you to take it seriously and give well, us a sequel to Science Craze that we have deserved and, and honestly, I've craved for well over a decade at this point. Bo, have you ever heard a podcaster so desperate to get another soundbite on a DVD cover? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, Revenge of the Fiend uh, has the the line from Doug Tilly. I've been waiting for over a decade for this film. Yes, as good as the original is what I'll say. <laughs> I mean, it can't help but be. I think I'm gonna do that in a Bad Ben style DIY project. Mm-hmm. Revenge of the Fiend, starring me and me, with additional voices by me. <laughs> with me as the fiend and the doctor. Um, Picture it. Nerve tests are being conducted around the world. <laughs> it'll start with that. That'll be like the introduction voiceover is like, yeah. you know, the nerve tests were conducted in uh, in several countries. The following countries. United <laughs> States. Peace. Peace. Italy. <laughs> Canada. <laughs> I can already feel a little irony <laughs> soaking into what's happening right now. <laughs> so, but, and all right, so that is the plot of Science Crazed. And that took a lot longer than I expected. Yeah, it took us over an hour to, to unpack it, and I'm just telling you, we're just getting started. I can do an hour just on, well, certainly the exercise scene. <laughs> all right, so I like to talk about the cast to highlight good and bad performances. Yes, I don't absolutely. know that there's a good performance here. Um, I would say that I would say that there there is a story that Cameron Schultz tells where the guy who's playing McCoy the detective yeah. was taking everything more seriously than he needed to. And good. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think that shows in the performance. On screen. Yeah. It shows on screen, yeah. Um I think that it's <laughs> 
it is a movie that appears to have been made without any direction from the director. I mean, I mean, Frank, uh, Doctor Frank, sorry, yeah, he didn't study seven years at <laughs> right. science craze school for nothing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Doctor Frank genuinely looks like a, like a, a double from a Thomas Dolby music video. He looks like he is going to help make the woman in weird science yes like that or maybe he's like one of the characters that the wild stallions will meet in the future <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but i i'm more i'm i'm less interested than what duncan and i have to say about the cast only because you know doug tilly of course champion of science crazed mm -hmm, like, what... I, I would say i would say expert uh, yeah. a, a, like a, a expert on science crazed. gentlemen thank you for giving me my due here thank you uh <laughs> what is it you want me to tell you I, Bo? do you think <laughs> what do you think in in the performances <laughs> given in this film is there anything that feels close to legitimate Ooh, I mean, the f fact is, with the success of Science Crazed in my home country of Canada, most of these <laughs> actors are household names at this point. So it's hard to kind of uh, to untangle their reputations uh, and their awards. A, a heavy fog of sarcasm that's come down. <laughs> well, in credit where it's due, Cameron Scholes went on to do a lot of like makeup work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one hundred percent. And he he he's worked in the business more so than almost anyone else involved with the production. Look. It's, it's like we run into with a lot of performances in um, martial arts movies mm. and Jolly where they're not using their same voices and that affects the performance. So it's hard yes. to judge what the performances are necessarily like. I think that the three leads, um, maybe the, the, the police detective guy is, is a little overboard, but Cameron Scholes and I guess Robin Hartzell is probably the other one. They're fine. I mean, it's, you know, they're... They're amateur, but they're fine. But what are you talking about? Who gives a shit, right? <laughs> this movie isn't, like, honestly, I would prefer this movie if it didn't have the part with, with the people trying to search for the, the fiend at all. If it was just the stalking scenes again and again and again, and then the movie just fucking ended. Yeah. And you yeah. were left yeah, thinking, yeah. what is going on? I watched a movie from Wave Productions called The Kind of Meat You Can't Buy at the Store. And this movie is a mud wrestling fetish movie but i but it's it, in the package of a of a horror movie so there's a part where a guy gets a woman and he puts her in this tub of mud and slop and they just like roll around for like 40 minutes straight that movie has more plot than science craze does uh this feels like a fetish movie for someone whose fetish is walking slowly and that is what's so fascinating about it this is a movie that is unlike any other. And look, I might be feel, maybe I'm exaggerating slightly about some of the qualities of it. But whatever qualities Science Craze has, it's not in the cast, and it's not in the filmmaking, and it's not in the yeah. pacing, and it's not really in anything you can see when you're actually sitting down and watching it. It's having experienced it as a whole, and then being able to tell people that you saw it and that they should see it too. Well, th there's a, there is that thing where, like, well made, well crafted fairly generic fairly standard movies you will sit and watch i don't want to throw shade at blumhouse but there's a lot of blumhouse movies i've seen in the last <laughs> decade that i would genuinely struggle to remember specific scenes from i will not forget science crazed like Recent, for, yeah. for 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 all for you know it's one of those things where i like this movie for better or worse is now taking a little part of my brain and it's set up a little a little camp there and it's never gonna go as you know it's one of those experiences where um you know it like it's it's surprisingly memorable for a movie that takes a lot of time to get to things that don't pay off um you know what <laughs> you i mean it's the case it, that it never gets to that point at all yeah <laughs> and i think and, like, if you i think you're right i think the difference between me like leaning in with actually this is a, a an incre <laughs> an incredible commentary on how people perceive slasher movies um by kind of almost voyeuristically giving you the, the chase but never giving you the kill so to speak it's kind of there you know what i mean but, but they they then do the, they have to they try and make it a movie by the end by you know 
like, oh, they're, you know, they've tracked him down, and now they're trying to shoot him, yeah. and now he's killing them, and now he's got a machete in his neck, and now it's over, or is it? Look, this um, is outsider art. I mean, I, I'm not even yeah. saying that with any sort of... Yeah, no, no. This is an outsider art example, because this is someone who thought that they were making something, but yes. bec because of circumstance, because of lack of skill, perhaps, it enters into it, but still with a combination of a vision of the kind of movie that they wanted to make, they made a movie unlike any other. And the yeah. thing is, think about how many fucking movies there are. Think about how many movies get released every single week. Mm -hmm. There's still no movie like Science Crazed, even amongst the, the kind of oeuvre of terrible movies, ones that people make fun of and mock. This isn't a movie that you can sit down to, like like a, The Room or something like that, where you're just like, ha yeah. ha, um, we're making fun of it. There's nothing to make fun of, even though we yes. just <laughs> give it our best attempt, because a lot of it is just breathing and walking and endless yeah. scenes of nothingness and you're, you're right there's it's not intentional it's not trying to say something through its filmmaking that is that is a bigger than the movie itself but you you can bring that to it because it's oh, so different it's like an alien trying to make a fucking movie well this, this, <laughs> we, we spoke about like we like me and bo many many moons ago spoke about and it's interesting because 91 i think is also the same year winter beast was released <laughs> so, uh -huh. something fucking strange happening in that year um or people were saying it was the death of horror cinema in the early 90s i beg to differ um but like there's a there's a there's a thing about that movie as well that when you're watching it it kind of it, it, although that one is he <laughs> is he more accomplished movie it's much more competently made yeah, yeah but the, there are like we spoke about it at length during our you know duncan and bow episode on winter beast our one of three i think we had um where we, we leaned into that where it kind of there's part of it that feels like there's almost it's, it's how you would imagine someone who'd never seen cinema before try or never seen a horror movie try to construct a horror movie like it's that way where like i tell people when when i you know people what, what music do you listen to and i say well i listen to like a lot of extreme music a lot of metal and all the rest and you inevitably either get one of two responses to that by someone that doesn't know the music they'll either go oh you mean like Def leopard and you want to punch them uh because not a Def leopard or you get the one where it's also <laughs> kind of noise that kind of that's that sort of feel in this movie where you're like that oh, i'm gonna make a, a horror movie oh it's just gonna be stop 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 and i'm just gonna oh the weird creature's gonna come after you and it's on that like it kind of does feel foreign and it does feel alien and it does feel slightly like disconnected but more than slightly disconnected but winter beast is kind of the same and that <laughs> uh, you know and there are whole sections in that movie like the the, the scene where they did wearing the clown mask and dancing to the jaunty <laughs> to which is absolutely jaw-droppingly <laughs> unsettling but it like there, there was a reason it's in that movie and like while it was filming it, it had a purpose it was when it was constructed in the film it didn't quite make sense or kind of fit the jigsaw and that kind of is here like on paper this like if you were looking at it as he's like a slasher movie like if you took the beats out it has the appropriate amount of death and kills um it just never really seems to understand what tension is or how to build that in and as a result, it becomes an exercise in the, the kind of fundamentals of setting up a kill, which isn't worth the, the setup. And it's, it's so bizarre. But those things are the things that will stick with me. Like, I, I the weird thing about it is, having only seen the movie twice, uh, I know, <laughs> not as much as Doug, uh, but there is a thing where, like, next year, if you sat down and said, right, Duncan, what I need from you is what happens in Science Craze, I think I could pretty comfortably... <laughs> tell you what happens in science crazed <laughs> whereas like there are there's movies that i saw last year that i know for a fact have great budget and great acting and great effects and all the rest that you ask me i might remember a scene and that'll be about it and i think there's there's a there's a there's something to acknowledge in that which I think is kind of is interesting. It is like for all its flaws, and I personally think it has a lot of them. It has created something which, I mean, your 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 one line tag on the back is is pretty spot on. If ever there was one, um, and the, the, and I like how it's, it's a quote that doesn't take a side. It's not saying that yeah. it's good. It's not saying it's bad. It's just that you haven't seen anything it's accurate. like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's accurate. It's not good or bad. It's accurate. I've never seen anything like this movie. I don't think I ever will again. So, uh, all right. So, just to land this plane, <laughs> um, 
it, where's it landing, there, though, boy? Is it Canada? <laughs> France? <Let's>... Italy? <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to have to give this a rank out of 10? Yeah, oh, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. But I want to ask first for for two things from you, gentlemen. One, mm. is there a theme to this movie besides the, the more broad, like, well, don't mess with science, you know, that kind of <laughs> Frankenstein kind of vibe? Is there a point to this? And, and two, even though that we... I, I just want to make sure that everyone gets their day in court. So if you have final <laughs> thoughts, wrap it up in in that answer of, is there a point to this? And if not, what? Wh what? Why? why? Yeah, why? <laughs> Say we interpret this in the most capitalistic way possible, which is that mm. Ron Switzer decided to make a horror movie to try to launch his film career to make money, right? Because this movie, even though it came out in 1991, was clearly made in the 80s. There's even yeah. a fucking phone book from 1987, just to make it very <laughs> clear that this, this movie took some time to come out. So say, say that that was his purpose. I'm going to make a marketable film that you can put on video and sell copies of, and then I'll use that to, to make other movies afterwards. Same formula that a hundred other directors, a thousand other directors have done. So why did he make it like this? Why wouldn't he have made it? It seems like in some ways it's harder to make a movie like this. Certainly the editing must have been a lot fucking yeah. harder than a regular movie would have been. So you could say it's incompetence. You could say that it's because they just didn't have enough footage and they had to stretch it as much as possible. But maybe there's purpose behind some of it because there's purpose behind some of what's on the screen, at least in terms of how it looks, right? The spotlight thing where the shadows and stuff like that, the woman sitting in or standing in the middle of the arcade and the camera circling around her, when they talked to, again, they talked to the cinematographer, they said on the commentary, and he said he was trying to make a serious movie. Yeah. He was trying to make something. Failure or success, that is something to be applauded. So in terms of the theme of the movie, it doesn't matter. I don't think, I mean, yes, absolutely. It's supposed to be a Frankenstein thing, but at some point it loses the plot, whatever plot it even has. What <laughs> matters is the wider, the wider uh, symbology of, of its existence, which is that you can try to make something with your motivations being kind of perverted and your motivations being that you want to make money or maybe you just want to see what you can do or maybe you're just doing it to do it but you can still come up with something that will endure because it's not like anything else and i want that to be the motivating factor that people take away from science craze we are in this blessed circumstance where the democratization of movie making has come to the point where anybody has the ability to make a movie it doesn't have to look great doesn't have to look professional or slick but you all Everyone pretty much has a camera in their pocket that can allow them to make a movie and there's no reason and there's nothing stopping you from doing it. But if you're going to do it, don't make a worse version of the kind of movie that you see in a theater. Make something that no one has ever seen before. And then look, maybe people will mock it and people will say, what the hell are you doing? But if you want to be remembered in one year by Duncan McClash, the best way to do so <laughs> is to make it in a way that no one has ever seen anything like it. So make a movie that's never been made before. Make a movie that has been made, it's never been made in that style before and break all the rules. And the way you break those rules is by not knowing how to do it in the first place. It's interesting because like on the, on the back of that, while you were talking about that, Doug, what it reminded me of is um, the last broadcast, which has recently found its way to Blu-ray and... Um, purchased it and I, I was desperate to check out the special features because those are two guys who made that movie, like wrote the movie starred in the movie edited the movie and it was that's an arduous edit that um, who ultimately went on to do nothing really after that they both have, they both are part of like some sort of institute for filmmakers or whatever but they're not necessarily they didn't go away and make another like movie movie if you know what i mean they went away and did like smaller projects and led into to other things took that technical expertise that they learned like so far ahead of the the curve what's interesting and why it links back is that it's it's the same principle that they've went to make that movie in that when you hear them talk in their their interview which is a fascinating interview with the two of them they talk about how they just wanted to make a movie and a horror movie seem like a good idea because you don't have to put like a huge amount of money into it and they, they usually make their money back um, but they both came from technical backgrounds so all the rendering stuff that you see in the cameras were was kind of done in post 
and they were working with like really like at the at the time cutting edge technology but there's a there's a sequence in their their interview where they talk about um the cost of a gigabyte hard drive at the time was a thousand dollars right and as a result the movie had to be chopped up into like about 12 different sections and then rendered somewhere else and then moved again for them to bring this together and they went through all this craft and all this pain and then the movie came out and i think on some level at the back of their head they thought well this is going to be huge i mean look look at all the effort all the time we've put in it and all the rest and that movie's i mean it's a you know it, <laughs> It didn't help that Blair Rich Project came out like six months after, but right, right. you know, yeah, like that. You know, it was it was it was doing something really interesting. It was doing something really cool. In a lot of respects, it's a deeply flawed movie, um, but it, it very much like <laughs> Science Crazy in some extent is someone trying to make their mark in cinema, for better or for worse, but giving it a shot and like even now even now it's it's still people are still catching up to the last broadcast and you know still finding the movie are still like reading into it and like the, those guys themselves didn't want to talk about the movie for the longest period of time so uh, uh, there's all this mystique that builds around it but it's uh, it's an exercise in trying to put something out into the world that is from you it's, it's your creative output and if everyone's creative output was like a like Picasso level of intrigue and genius and all the rest then as people we wouldn't know the value of things that are great and the value of things that aren't and at the same time even subjectively thinking about the movie the one thing that came to me is like that I like it's, it's fine for me to sit there and laugh and giggle and all the rest I I almost 100% know that if I went to make a film it would suck Mm -hmm. because I, I i i would obsess about things too much and i would i would get i'd be so lost in trying to make one great scene great that everything else would fall apart and the fact that the guy went out there and did something and you know it's, it's available as a cult following he's made his mark on cinema and i i think that is cool because in a in a, in a, a system that we exist now where like studios can churn up horror movies very 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 fast um and they're like all cut from the same cloth and most of them have the you know same look or same style same soundtrack um where we can get that to me the the stuff that is of interest not necessarily like full of like artistic merit and worth but of interest are the things where people try and fail as opposed to half ass it and succeed because there's plenty of the the um, what's it? It feels like I'm taking pot shots at Blumhouse, and I don't mean to. <laughs> but a Blumhouse movie will perform well because the machine is designed to make money. Right. That is literally it. They know how much money they have to put into the movie. They know how much money they have to put in the market, and there is an equation somewhere that tells them roughly how much that movie is going to make. Generally, makes that that amount, and if it makes more than that, then you know everyone's getting a christmas bonus as is that level whereas this guy is live by the sword die by the sword and I, if i was him i would never like come out of the obscurity that yeah because, absolutely yeah yeah yeah, the, yeah like what well, he's he's doing the late mungo thing where, where that director has never done anything else does not talk about the movie once again that blurry came out recently they couldn't speak to me didn't want to speak about the movie uh, you know, I don't want to speak about Late Mungo. So, like, the, the the best thing for the mystique of that movie to continue on is for him to do whatever it is he does in life now, and uh, and just keep doing that. I, it's, I, I'm I'm glad that I've seen this movie. I'll be honest with you, Doug. I've now seen it twice. <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever watch it again, but the conversation has been worth the six years wait. So, I I recently ate the world's hottest gummy bear. <laughs> it's six million scovilles my, my wife bought it for me and she wanted me to eat it because she was tired of me saying that i enjoy hot food so and i i sat there and i ate it and it was very unpleasant just a thoroughly unpleasant horrible experience you can feel it burning in your chest and in your stomach mm -hmm. it's just this horrible thing but when i was done i was so happy to have done it because then I have that, not only that memory, but I also have now connected myself with everyone else who's ever done it. Yeah. Because we have a share of that experience together. No, it wasn't pleasant, but it was certainly memorable. 
It was certainly something we're not going to forget. And that's the thing. We can be tied together with unpleasantness sometimes in a way that can be even more profound than something of quality. And I think that Science Crazed is the six million Scoville gummy bear that ties us <laughs> together. <laughs> and, and I think that that's important. So this is why, for me, it's important that people I care about watch this movie and experience it because then we have that that ties us together. And that's something that can never be lost. There is a cult of science crazed that is a cult that is unlike other cult, so-called cult films, because mm -hmm. this is a movie that requires not just patience, but also a resistance to the pain that it causes. And like actual physical <laughs> nausea from being bombarded with these really unpleasant, like, like it's unpleasant in the sense of, of repetitiveness. And it, it is an experience that is more about uh, toughing it out than almost anything else. But that is unique in cinema, I think, to a very great extent. And and we now are part of that club. We're part of the Science Craze Club for having watched this and talked about it. All right. Well, it is time then to rate this particular gummy bear. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll, here on this show, we do a, a one to five scale. Half stars are allowed. No quarter stars because we are not monsters. Certainly. Um, so uh, I'm still wrestling with this. You guys go first. No problem. Five stars. All right. Fair enough. Uh, Duncan, uh, similarly five stars. Hey, no, no. But, like, <laughs> that, that, yeah, like, like, like <laughs> he just did it. He just did it right. Like he just like shot that five right out there. Um, what's weird, what's weird about this is uh, like there are. I'd like not to labor the point too much, but I'd like I'm currently going through like a series. Of, I've been doing it for years now. Uh, the the video nasties. There's a ton of movies in there, um, which are horrible. <laughs> um, and I, I think about how I would score them. And interestingly enough, I'd probably score Science Crazed above something like Frozen Screams, which I think is an absolute fucking. Uh, uh sort of bit of cinema I, I i but i couldn't in any good conscience go above and i'm sorry doug i love you a bit it's 1.5 i, I feel like i feel like you can only give this movie five stars or five stars. <laughs> yeah yeah i i know there's, there's a there's a thing about like i said this brought this brought me two tears in the scene and that merit something it doesn't merit five stars well, it's probably the only movie that's brought me to tears in both ways that you could be. Yes. Oh, like, there was like, yeah, yeah. That, the, the, there you go. Like, there, there's the tagline. There's the fucking tagline right there. Like, I, I genuinely, the cop scene had me howling with laughter, like, like in pain, laughing at it. And for that, it scene may be alone, howl in laughter and pain. Yes. <laughs> Also a back Five of the box stars. quote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, I'm go I'm going to go one point five. All right, I. Eh. <laughs> it, the, this is tough because I, I, I think I'm gonna land weirdly right in the middle. Oh come on! I, I know, oh, I know that sounds. Purple state bow strikes again. Purple state bow <laughs> once more. Um, not pick it aside. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I, I think it's true because it's like I, I agree. You know what? Fuck it. I'm gonna make this a solid three. Because I kind of recommend this movie because it is, as Doug described, it is just so unusual. You've never seen anything like Science Craze. It is not a good movie, but I have a, such a, a, a soft spot in my heart for um, movies that are more passion than quality. And there is something unique about a movie like this. It's the same way I feel about, you know, Winter Beast and all that stuff. It is, mm -hmm. you know, I, it, is Winter Beast more entertaining? Sure. But is it equally head scratching? Yeah. I mean, it is it, like neither of the, of, of those examples follow the rules of narrative <laughs> and, and are, are just a, in some ways, an endurance, uh, like a cinematic endurance test. In other ways, it, it's just this curiosity. It's the same reason I like taking long road trips to stop by those roadside attractions that, you know, charge you two bits of gander to look at, you know, here's a mermaid skeleton or, or something like that. Um, I find that stuff really interesting and, and silly and kitschy and all that, but... But I genuinely enjoy it. I can't deny that I don't 
like watching science crazed, I did come away from it thinking I, I don't, not only will I not forget this movie at some point, I will pass this infection along yeah, like yeah, some this, cinematic this STD. A hundred percent. Like there, there will be a conversation somewhere down the road and I can guarantee this. And it's not something I do often where I will, I will say, you know, you should check out Science Crazy. Yeah, I, I think. Um, yeah. yeah, I think there's that. The, you know, like like Doug was describing, there is there is kind of that, uh, like a, a brotherhood, uh, a community of people that are like, oh, I like bad movies. Give me, give me your worst. And 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 it's not entirely irony in terms of that enjoyment. It is. It is. I like the, the, you know this Ed Wood quality of. Don't really know how to make a movie, but by God, we're going to make one. Mm. And I kind of respect that. And I, I sort of love the end products of that because you can, when you see the seams, the obvious seams in a movie like this, it, it, it feels real. Like you feel connected to the movie making in a way that you couldn't possibly with like a big budget Marvel movie yeah. where it's so yeah. highly polished that it's just, it is, it is a thing unto itself. Whereas when you're watching this, you're like, oh, yeah, so they had the one spotlight. Okay, I see where they used it in this scene. <laughs> and here's where they reuse the same shot of him dragging his foot down the hallway for the fourth time. And but it, then you have to wonder about the other decisions, the ones that they didn't have to make, right? Like yeah. the woman just talking in the arcade. It's just like, why is she talking? What is she saying? What is this all about? Why is this scene even in? What's her background? Yeah. What is yeah. happening here? Yeah. Right? And so it, there is an extra level of... And, and I don't think artistry is the right word, but certainly there's a kind of an accidental surrealism that's created by the yep. poor talent of the people on display. And that, to me, is very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, more than anything else, like, again, completely devoid of any sort of irony or ironic enjoyment of this movie. It is fascinating as yes, a piece yeah. of filmmaking because because of those choices that are completely inscrutable and there aren't answers to it. And in much the, the the same way as David Lynch describes his own work of like, I don't think you should have all the answers that some things should just be mysterious. And there is never not going to be an air of mystery around this movie because we don't have all the answers of why did they do it this way? And why is this like this? And that's why you can't come back. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's why he physically can't come back because the answer to the question of why does the girl talk, but we can't hear her could be something as simple as we didn't have time to ADR that, and you know, like it could be something as as banal as that. But at this yeah, point, or no one wrote down what she was saying, so yeah. we couldn't. Yeah, absolutely, we couldn't. We couldn't. We couldn't sync it up. Yeah. Um, and that 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 is not as interesting as why did they do that? You know, that's that's the stuff that's interesting. Yeah. So it, it, yeah. the the only problem with the movie for me is there is that that, that <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms of recommending, in terms of recommending, is there is that asterisk of you have to be the kind of person that enjoys this kind of movie that, mm. that if, if you, you know, if like the worst movie you ever saw was a Godzilla movie, yeah. you know, <laughs> then it's like, well, this ain't for you because this, you are treading into, you know, the, the deep woods of cinema when you're watching yeah. something like this. Yeah, yeah. This isn't for beginners. Yeah. This, <laughs> right. this isn't the yeah. one you start with, right? You, and things might be a movie that you could start with and still get some enjoyment out of something like that. That's why I wrinkle a bit at the two movies kind of being compared a lot, yeah. because to me, it's like that you're going from, from easy to difficult in terms of your, uh, uh, attempts to appreciate something. But that said, you watch science crazed after the first 15 minutes, you'll know whether this is something that you're going to be able to handle or not. Yeah, yeah. For, for sure. Okay, so normally we end the show with, uh, here are some trivia that you may not know about the movie. We've kind of <laughs> peppered a lot of that in as we've talked about this. But the one thing I will point out that the whole thing was shot, in fact, in Rod Switzer's apartment building in the year of our Lord, 1987. Um, yeah. so that, that is something that we did not explicitly say, yeah, but that happened. Uh, and, and the other stuff that I would have pointed out was, you know, stuff like Ron Switzer being one of the guys who ADR'd a lot of the voices in this movie and, uh, and things like that. But, uh, um, I, I'll look to the real conclusion of this is me just saying how much I love talking about this with you guys. <laughs> This has been a wonderful conversation. And and surprisingly, 
like uh, optimistic, I think, about the whole idea of movie making in a weird way. And and I really I really appreciate that. That's wonderful. We we ran through on my show every single movie that William Friedkin did and we have recorded for almost <laughs> almost a quarter of that time on one movie so there you go ladies and gentlemen if that isn't a ringing endorsement i don't know what yeah is. so uh in the interest of getting out of here before we doubled the length of <laughs> of science craze uh starting with duncan where can people uh find your further work so that they can listen to more out of you yeah, if you're interested, you can check me out on podcast under the stairs. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts. I have a second feed called the Teapots Collective. That's T P U T S. Um, Teapots Collective has uh, four other shows that I do that are all still about cinema, but in different kind of styles and flavors with different voices uh, you can find everything though all housed under my website which is tputscast that's t-p-u-t-s-c-a-s-t dot com and thank you very much for the invite bro ah my pleasure and uh, doug how about for you well, my main gig is over at cinemasmorgasbord.com, which is an umbrella podcast. I mean, somewhat influenced by my experience with the podcast Under the Stairs, where we have a lot of podcasts underneath mm. it, including the legendary Eric Roberts is the fucking man, and, and as well as uh, podcasts devoted to the career of Jackie Chan, uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky, Carol Kane, uh, Eurocrime, uh, Dick Miller, and so on and so on. Check that out over at cinemasmorgasbord.com. We've talked a little bit today about No Budget Nightmares. That is a podcast devoted to micro-budget cinema, currently on hiatus. You can find it at nobudgetpodcast.com. But if you do want to check out our most recent work, we provided a feature-length commentary for the VHS version of Bloodletting uh, uh, that you can get through makeflix.com. Uh, they have a super special Blu-ray edition coming out with all sorts of special features, but that includes the original VHS version. And Mopor and I sat down and did a feature-length commentary for the great JR book, Walter. We have also uh, appeared on commentaries for a number of his films, including The Dead Next Door, Robot Ninja, et cetera, et cetera. Find those over at Makeflix and uh, get yourself a copy. Excellent. Uh, all right. Well, I'll be back in a minute to wrap up the show. Thank you again, gentlemen. It was uh, more than a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And there you have it. If you have made it through that marathon conversation about science craze, uh, I think you're probably a better person for it. Uh, I am. I said this during the course of the conversation, but I, I always like it when uh, a discussion of a movie like this that is maybe not the <laughs> that that is a, a maybe challenged in terms of of cinematic entertainment uh but it leads to a conversation about movie making and why people make movies and and it that is one of the things that i fall in love with over and over again uh talking about a lot of these films is especially some of the lower budget and some of the cheaper movies uh, i'm always of the mind that you know you're not going to be able to do what a big budget movie does so do the thing that they would never do and science craze definitely does that i will i will give credit where it is due but uh more than that um it was just a tremendous amount of fun to talk about i had such a good time recording this i hope you had a good time listening to it um and uh, as always look uh, if, if you would rate and review the show wherever you can share it around on social media when you can uh, if you are enjoying the show, um, it is a, a tremendous uh, pleasure to do this show week in and week out. And uh, after some hiccups, like uh, my output's been a little bit slower. We've still been getting the main episodes out on time. The bonus episodes like uh, Sinister Sunday and so forth been a little bit more difficult of late. But uh, we're trying to remedy that and, and bring uh, more of a steady pace to the proceedings. Um, but I also have like another vacation coming up and things like that. So, you know, we'll see how it all goes. But, uh, the one thing you can uh, be guaranteed is you will always be getting at least a couple of episodes a week, if not three. So, uh, back off, huh? Just like, uh, Charlie McGee back off. So that's, uh, that's it for this episode. Uh, we have, uh, one more episode left in our listener request, which is, uh, really special to me because it brings back Hero Hero Go Show, which will officially be folded under uh, the Dark Parade as of that recording. And uh, yeah, so next week we're going to be talking about the Vampire Doll with Don and Ellie. And I think you're going to enjoy that one too. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for rating and reviewing. Thank you so much for sharing the show 
all the stuff that that you as listeners uh, do to help promote the show and uh, and and make it not just worth doing because it's worth it, it's worth doing because it's worth doing, but uh, seeing listeners join in and and really come along for the ride is uh, incredibly uh, encouraging and and heartwarming. And, uh, and I appreciate it more, more than I can say. So that is it for this time. Uh, we will be back very soon. In fact, uh, be back on Friday with a What You Watching with Jamie and Bo. Uh, and the plan is to do a Sinister Sunday on Sunday. So uh, keep an eye out for that. You can, of course, find more information uh, on Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Dark Parade uh, or over on Twitter at Dark Parade Pod. Uh, and until next time, thank you as always for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.